Welcome to History of England, episode 20, Henry V, the Warrior King. Now last time I looked at how Henry Bolingbroke managed to capture and depose Richard II. And since he took over in the coup d'etat, how he ended the Plantagenet dynasty and started the Lancastrian dynasty. Now I looked at what happened to depose Richard I, and, or Richard II, and finally I looked at the reign of Henry IV as Henry Bolingbroke became known. Now examining the reign, I looked at how Henry allowed his nobles to pretty much rule as they wanted, as long as they paid him respect and money when he needed it. I looked at the rebellion of his chief supporters, the Percy family in 1403, the murder of the Archbishop of York, Richard Scrope, on orders of Henry, the illness of Henry IV, and finally the character and rebellion of the heir to the throne, Henry of Monmouth, the Prince of Wales. Now today, I'm going to look at the reign of Henry V. And, you know, kind of look at really the way the Kingdom of England was starting to move. Really starting to move away from the Middle Ages into more of an early modern era. Now, Henry the Monmouth came to the throne and he was crowned Henry V. He made clear that his chief mission as king restore the kingdom's royal finances, deal with the ancient enemy of France. And he is going to also restore good government, redress injustice, redress and corruption in England. He was young, he was energetic, he was lean, he was fair, he had an oval face, short cropped brown hair. He looked like an ascetic. And if he had not become a king, he most likely would have become a prince. Sorry, a priest. Not a prince. He was a prince. He would have become a priest. And the night his father died, he went to see a recluse at Westminster Abbey and confessed all his sins to the man. He was crowned Passion Sunday, April 9th, 1413, amid hail and snow. The weather was said to show that his reign would be one of cold civility. Now, there's no doubt that Henry V was driven by a sense of divine right and duty. All his youthful pursuits had been abandoned almost overnight, and he became a grave and serious king. He was known for being pious and observed ceremonies, as well as many chaste until marriage. Now, he loved music in church. He spoke English naturally, unlike his father. In that respect, set the standard for the written records of England. He was something of a disciplinarian and dictatorial to those around him. He was an efficient administrator. He looked at the details closely. Why he did demand heavy taxes from his realm, he never spent the money unwisely. He had cordial relations with his nobles. He worked well with Parliament. He proved that if he keep his thumb on the seat of power, medieval government would work. <laughs> Bless me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, a few months after his coronation, his first real test came when he had to confront the forces of heresy. The Lollards, I've already talked about. Now, in the spring of 1413, they were still around, and a point crisis had been reached. In his first parliament, as king, a proclamation was pinned to the doors of the London churches stating that if the brethren were to face persecution and be forced to become outlaws, a force of 100,000 men would rise up to protect them. Now, in a state of alarm and insecurity that followed, one of the king's best friends, Sir John Oldcastle, was accused of harboring and promoting heretics. I think it's a matter of irony, therefore, that about 200 years later, the character of Falstaff in the plays Henry IV, Part One, Henry IV, Part Two, Henry V, and I believe he's in the Very Wise of Windsor, all by way of Shakespeare, was named Old Castle at one point. Now the proclamations fixed to the church doors are traced back to Old Castle and to one of his chaplains, who was found to be practicing lawlord. Old Castle was found to have certain heretical tracts in his possession, and Henry tried to argue with him and urge him to recant, but Old Castle refused, and so he was taken to the Tower of London in the fall of 1413. And his trial, he repeated the law of disregard for confession and for doctrine of transubstantiation. He was judged a heretic and handed over to the second government to be executed by being burnt at the stake. But Henry V intervened and gave him 40 days to search his conscience. But instead of doing so, Old Castle managed to escape the Tower of London. He stayed in hiding for two months in London. He came up with a plan to assassinate Henry V and Henry's brothers, Thomas Lancaster, Duke of Clarence, 
John of Lancaster, Duke of Bedford, and Humphrey of Lancaster, Duke of Gloucester. He then planned to lead the general rebellion of Lollards. Now messengers were passed back and forth in secret to the brethren, asking them to meet at St. Giles Field, just outside of London. However, someone talks, someone always talks. And on January 9th, 1414, the king moved his forces to the field. As the Lollards marched towards London, they were dispersed and sent to Newcastle Prison. Thirty-eight of them ended up being hanged, drawn, and quartered at St. Giles Field as a warning. Now, this was never a general insurrection, and perhaps maybe three, four hundred people took part in it, but it did effectively destroy any sympathy with the Lowland movement among the general population. The heresy was now considered the same as rebellion. Now, Old Castle managed to evade capture for about four more years, but then he was captured, captured in Welsh Pole, Wales, and taken back to London. There, he was hanged above a fire, which consumed both the gallows and the victim. In his last words, before this very painful death, he promised he would rise again in three days. But he's still in his grave, for though during the English Reformation, he became a proto-martyr of Protestantism, which is most likely why Shakespeare changed the name of his character to Falstaff. Anyway, this rebellion was a really small distraction to Henry. He was busy for war. He had around himself a group of young men who saw in battle and victory the well wreath of glory. Principal among them were his three brothers, who I just mentioned, Thomas, John, Humphrey. Okay, and all of them were totally committed to war as a way to further the dynasty. After all, if Henry V did not have any children, and he wasn't married at this point, well, one of them would be king someday. So in this lust of glory and belief that war was the greatest duty a king could be involved in, the Hundred Years' War again started, and the new king moved against France. Now, Henry had been made Duke of Aquitaine in 1399, among his many other titles, and now he wished to reclaim all the territory that had been handed over to England in 1360. So, in the summer of 1415, he felt ready. He had met a parliament. He, the parliament had granted him necessary funds without the usual grumbling. His troops and his ships had been gathered, and it seems the nation supported the mission of Henry V, yet not all were ready to bow to him yet. Now, some felt the Lancastrians had seized power illegally, and so in the days before the exposition got started, some nobles tried to organize a rebellion. They were stopped and quickly executed. This is the last time anyone would threaten the reign of Henry V. So Henry sailed to France with an army of 8,000 men, made up of mounted and unmounted mounted archers, Knights, foot soldiers, fletchers, boyer, boyers, carpenters, priests, surgeons, gunners, engineers. Henry was prepared for a long campaign of siege warfare, figuring that the French would not fight, but would hide behind the, cats, the city walls and their castles as they had in the last phase of the Hundred Years' War. There's also a royal officer known as the Grand Sergeant. His only job was to hold the king's head in case he got seasick. Nice job if you can get it. There's also 15,000 horses, and unlike many armies before this, there is no female camp followers allowed with the army. If a prostitute was found among the soldiers, she would be fined all the money she had, have one of her arms broken, and then driven away from the army by being beaten with wooden staves. The army sailed from Southampton on August 11th and headed to Normandy, which belonged by tradition to Henry, so he claimed. Once in Normandy, Henry moved on the port city of Harfleur at the mouth of the River Sin. But this was not an easy victory. The town held out until September 22nd, 1415, during which time many of the English soldiers came down in dysentery, eating of unripe fruit. But once the town had surrendered, Henry started to make it into an English colony. After all, Harfleur was connected to Rouen, and was connected to Paris by the river, so this was a desirable possession. And Henry showed that while he was a rigid and a severe disciplinarian in combat, he was also able to plan well and keep control over his court at Westminster from a long distance away. But he was always in a hurry. It seemed like he knew he had only limited time on earth, maybe. From Hoffler, he moved northeast or Calais, 120 miles away. But then he heard that the French army was waiting on the right bank of the Somme. So he detoured. He marched along the left bank of the Somme, looking for a way across. It took him two weeks to cross the river, and when he finally turned to, turned to Calais again, he knew that before he reached the city, he would have to face the French army, which was slowly shadowing him. 
On October 24th, his scouts found the French army outside the village of Avancourt. Henry rested his man. He ordered a strict silence in the camp. He knew that the following day would decide the fate of the campaign for the French had a larger army. So the next morning, he went to three masses, got on his horse, put his gold crown on his helmet. He had 8,000 men against an army of 20,000. But of those 8,000, 6,000 of them were archers, and the French did not have many archers. The French figured that their knights would win a day, and they still thought that when they saw the English, the English would run. Such as the English formed into a thin line facing them. But heavy rain had turned landscape into a field of treacherous mud. For three hours, the two armies faced each other, but neither side made the first move. Finally, Henry ordered his archers to march 700 yards in front of their western troops. There, they rammed sharp pointed stakes in front of themselves and, taking aim, fired on the French, which caused immediate carnage in the French ranks. The French cavalry charged, and those who managed to actually get across the field impaled themselves on the stakes. So the French moved the rest of their army forward, but now the English archers continued to fire into the massed army, which went down to the mud and blood of the field, or were trapped by fleeing horses and men coming back from the English side. As the bodies of the French dead piled up on the field, Henry ordered his army forward. Two-thirds of the French army fled the field of battle, yet Henry was not certain he won, for there's still a third of the French army to fight. They had not yet fit and fought. So Henry ordered the French prisoners that he had be killed, which went against the rules of chivalry. It also cost the English money, because they could have ransomed these men back. But he didn't want them to overwhelm their guards and attack him from the rear. At least that's what the historians figure. But a heated battle, and through the mist of fog in history, we cannot know the real truth. His command, however, was not totally carried out, and hundreds of nobles survived to be ransomed later on. But the Battle of Avancourt was over. The English had won a decisive victory. So Henry continued to march on Calais and captured the city, rested for a few days, and then sailed back to London, where on December 22nd, sorry, December 20, the, yeah, November 23rd, not December, November 23rd, he was greeted as Lord of England, Flower of the World, Soldier of Christ. The city of London held a huge celebration for his victories. But Henry needed a truce, and that was not forthcoming. The sinews of war were released again, the blood allowed to settle into the ground, yet Henry saw himself as favored and protected by God, and the right of his dysentery, um, yeah, yeah. his right of his um, dynasty to rule had been confirmed. He was now the leading figure in Europe, and Parliament had granted him a new set of taxes and guaranteed him for life the excise on exports of wool and leather. The French attempted to recapture, recapture Halflor the following summer, but were defeated in a naval battle by Henry's Royal Navy, which was as great as in the days of Alfred the Great. And in February 1417, Henry again came to France. He made it clear that he was there to claim the throne of France, his by right. So he started a series of sieges, first at Cannes, then slowly moving south until he arrived at Falas, where William the Conqueror had been born. Now Henry now controlled Normandy, and he moved on to the capital of the duchy, Rouen, where the siege lasted six months. Rouen finally surrendered on January 19th, 1419, and the way to Paris lay open. Henry and the King of France, Charles VI, along with his son, the Dauphin, sent representatives for peace talks, and the French brought along the Duke of Burgundy, but the talks were inconclusive. But then events proved better for the English heard that the Duke of Burgundy, John the Fearless, was assassinated on orders of the Dauphin Charles, and Burgundy now declared from the English. In the middle of this, Henry marched on the gates of Paris and demanded the crown. Who could deny it to him? The new Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, was inexperienced. The Dauphin was in disgrace, and the King of France, Charles VI, was technically insane. So after much debate, a treaty was agreed to in the spring of 1420. It was confirmed that Charles VI would disinherit his son, the Dauphin Charles, and declare Henry V heir to the throne. 
return, Henry would marry the daughter of the king, Catherine. So that any male child would automatically become king of France and England, the dream of Henry II. A great victory for Henry. Henry had won more than any English king before him. But events followed that proved that the Concord was ultimately unstable. After all, why should the French agree to be ruled from Westminster by a foreign king? And serious grumbling could be heard in the English Parliament. What's the wisdom of English domination of France? Already the cost of war was huge, and the cost of peace would be larger still. At home in England, Henry faced other problems. The English clergy had stopped praying for victory in 1417. And the Parliament of 1420, and again the Parliament of 1421, refused to grant any more money to continue the war. Now there was some money in the treasury, mostly from the knights and the soldiers of fortune who brought back booty and treasure from France, which the king then seized, calling it tax. But there were fears about English sovereignty among the people of England. What if, for instance, a treasurer was control both the treasury of France and the treasury of England? Would he not bind one with the interests of another? What if the king or the successor of Henry was to appoint a French noble as treasurer? Now these fears may be groundless, but they did exist, it's known, because of the chroniclers of the time he wrote them down. Now it's obvious that Henry was spending far too much time in France. He was trying to consolidate, consolidate his gains with further campaigns. He occupied the rest of Normandy and the so-called Vexin, which is a region of northwest France on the right back bank of the Seine. But there were still parts of France ruled by the Duke of Burgundy, and the Dauphin was still at large as well, so there was no peace to be had in divided land. Now in the summer of 1420, Henry V married Catherine of Valois. The couple moved on to the Love, the Louvre Palace in Paris, but since Henry wanted his wife crowned King, Queen of England, he was obliged to bring her to London, where she was crowned in Westminster on February 23rd, 1421, uniting the Valois and Lancastrian dynasties. But Henry did not stay in England for long. By May, he was back in France, countering French resistance and rebellion. Fighting for his gains, he became sick by besieging the town of Marat, and after lapsing into fever, grew weaker. Sensing that he was dying, he added a, a part to his will. He had an eight-month-old son named Henry. And the child was handed over to be raised and protected by his younger brother, Humphrey of Lancaster, Duke of Gloucester. Henry V then died on August 31st, 1422. His corpse was brought back to London to be buried in the Abbey. Misgivings of the War of France were forgotten in celebration of Henry V and his partial valor. A man devout and magnificent, chaste and earnest, generous to his friends, stern to his enemies, Prudent and magnanimous, modest and temperate, the very model of a medieval king. But what did he achieve in the end? Once his French conquests were taken back in the next thirty years, and the dream of a new monarchy dissolved, there's very little to remember about him. But there's one unintended consequence of his reign. English was now spoken by all of the subjects of the throne of England. Henry V had always written English, unlike those who had gone before him, and in his reign, the first official document of royal administration was written in English, and we date it to 1410. The Archbishop of Canterbury now spoke of the English Church, and said that England was a nation, part of the universal kingdom of Christ, as ruled by the Apostle of St. Peter, from the Sea of St. Peter in Rome. So next time, we are going to start to turn away from France and toward the infighting that developed under Henry VI. And we're going to be looking at, at that simpleton's early years on the throne. And we're going to begin to look at the light at the end of the tunnel of medieval England and the beginning of Renaissance England. All this and more on the next episode of History of England. Stay tuned. <laughs>